little less about how AI can play a role for pathologists and really focus more from a prognostic and a predictive standpoint. So really try to make the case that artificial intelligence and pathology can really provide prognostic and predictive and diagnostic tools to really aid the clinician in questions surrounding precision medicine. Uh, these are my cockpit of interest disclosures. So the lifetime probability of a man in the United States being diagnosed with some form of cancer is about 50%. For women, it's only marginally better. One in three women in the U.S. will be diagnosed with some form of cancer, which effectively means that 40% of the American population is going to be diagnosed with some form of cancer in their lifetime. Now, it's really when you look at the actual mortality of blood cancer in the U.S., it's slightly different from this one. It's about 600,000 deaths, which still is a very large number, but represents about 0.2% of the total population. In other words, there is a mismatch or a discordance between the 40% number with regards to cancer in the US versus the actual number of people who are dying from cancer in the So now there are two reasons why there is this uh, why that is important. One of which is the fact that we do a much better job in imaging earlier, identifying screening, detecting, diagnosing disease earlier, the much better biomarkers that we have at our disposal. But along with all of this comes a very real problem of overdiagnosis. Jonathan in his talk talked about prostate cancer being one of the more overdiagnosed and hence overtreated diseases. And overdiagnosis and overtreatment really does cause harm because we know that a lot of patients prostate cancer is a classic example where men actually have indolent disease and will actually die with the prostate cancer rather than on account of it, but still get treated with radiation, still get treated with surgery. And overtreatment can not just cause toxicity or harm to the patient, but there's also a very real issue of financial toxicity. And this might be less of an issue here in New Zealand or in Australia or in the UK, but in the US, um, there are statistics coming out like this, which are really alarming. 42% of new cancer patients in the U.S. lose their life savings within one year of the diagnosis of cancer. So there is not just the patient-centric toxicity on account of overtreatment. There's also a very real issue of financial toxicity. So all of this really begs the question about what can we do with AI, not just to address the issue of diagnosis and detection of disease, but how can we really start to use AI with pathology and imaging to try to address questions about prognosticating the aggressiveness of the disease, being able to do risk stratification of the disease better, more accurately. But more critically, how can we start to develop these tools as predictive, right? And so really looking at how we can develop tools to be able to predict therapeutic response, to know in advance who is going to receive added benefit from say chemotherapy or immunotherapy. Because as you've seen from the talks today, we still don't know as to which patients are going to truly benefit from some of these therapies. You saw the talk from Dr. Buckley this morning about immunotherapy with response rates being something like 20%. One in five patients are getting treated, one, pa one in five patients treated with immunotherapy are having sustained responses to immunotherapy. At the same time, Immunotherapy, which costs about $200,000 in the U.S. per patient per year, is resulting in about four out of five or $800,000 in treatment that doesn't really work or doesn't really help the patient. So a lot of the focus of our group has really been centered on how can we use AI to develop not just better diagnostic tools to aid in disease detection and diagnosis, but also how can this be used to develop prognostic and predictive tools to truly try to address this promise of precision medicine. 
And this is not to say that these tools don't exist. Probably the most famous example of a prognostic and a predictive companion diagnostic assay is Genomic Health Oncotype DX. So it's a 21 gene expression panel that essentially allows us to identify which early stage ER positive breast cancer patients truly need adjuvant chemotherapy. So over and above surgery and hormonal therapy, which of these patients will truly receive added benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy? And it's an important problem because nearly 70% of early stage ER positive breast cancers don't actually need chemotherapy. They can avoid the toxicity of chemotherapy, at the same time avoid the costs associated with chemotherapy. Now, this is a 21 gene expression assay. It involves destructive testing of the tissue, provides a risk score, high scores, suggest you have more aggressive disease and therefore will benefit from chemotherapy. Low risk scores suggest you actually could avoid more aggressive chemotherapy. Now, one of the challenges with a lot of these molecular diagnostic tests is the sampling of the tissue. Because one thing that we do know about cancer is that the more heterogeneous the disease, the more uh, clonality, multi-clonality the, the tumor has, uh, the more aggressive it is. But when you're picking representative tissue pieces or samples from the entire tumor to do the profiling, to do the expression analysis, very often you might miss a part of the tumor that truly captures the uh, true risk or the true aggressiveness of the tumor. Right? So there's a very real issue that the heterogeneity in the tumor might result in these molecular diagnostic tests providing an inaccurate representation of the true aggression potential of the tumor. On the other hand, as you've seen today, with whole slide imaging and digital pathology, there is this unprecedented opportunity to use artificial intelligence to start to interrogate the morphology of standard h and &E slides in a way that simply has not been possible to date. Or this term um, that uh, has been gaining some traction recently in the last, say, five to six years, or pathomics, uh, where you can use AI to go in and start to interrogate the morphology, the, uh, the, the sort of quantitative enumeration of the attributes of the tumor in a very detailed way, looking just at the standard H&E slide, but then using AI to go in and identify individual cells, cancer cells, uh, to look at the spatial interplay and the spatial architecture of the individual cells in the tumor to start to look at heterogeneity measurements and texture measurements of the different tissue compartments within the stroma, within the epithelium. And the opportunity now is that we can use AI to essentially convert this entire H&E slide into a digital signature, into a non-destructive digital signature that provides a quantitative description of the morphologic landscape of the tumor. Like I said, in a way that's completely unprecedented, in a way that was simply not possible, you know, even 10 or 15 years ago. Now, I got my start in digital pathology when I was still a grad student at the University of Pennsylvania. I had the good fortune of working with Mike Feldman and John Tomaszewski, two pathologists, who really introduced me to digital pathology. And some of the initial problems we looked at were trying to automate breast cancer grading or prostate cancer grading. But in 2007, I had the good fortune of meeting Sridhar Ganesan, a breast oncologist at Rutgers University, who looked at the work we were doing and said, well, Anant, have you thought about how the tools you're developing for breast cancer grading or prostate cancer grading could be used to directly address issues that are relevant to me as an oncologist? namely who to treat more aggressively and who not to treat aggressively. And so working together with Sridhar, we came up with the idea of the image-based risk score or IBRIS, which was analogous to Genomic Health's Oncotype DX, where the goal was to try to come up, based on the H&E slides alone, a score that told us about which tumors were more aggressive and needed chemotherapy versus those tumors that were less aggressive and therefore could avoid chemotherapy. And the beauty was, of course, this was completely non-destructive of the clinical workflow of pathology. You still had your H&E slide. The only difference now was you were digitizing the slide. Once it was digitized, you applied the AI algorithms to go in and look at the morphologic landscape of the tumor. And based on the patterns from routine H&E slide images alone, we were then able to convert that into a risk score, an image score that distinguished the more aggressive from the less aggressive tumors. Now, how does this work? Well, um, one part of it is deep learning. And so this is an example of some of the deep learning algorithms that we've developed that allows us to go in, identify individual cells, lymphocytes, cancer nuclei, mitotic figures, tubules from whole slide images very, very rapidly. You saw from 
uh, Peter Hamilton's talk that, uh, you know, deep learning really has become uh, a very, very powerful segmentation and detection tool. And so our group has been using and developing these tools for identifying and segmenting primitives as well. But about a couple of years ago, working with a group at the University of Pennsylvania, we asked the question whether we could use deep learning to do higher level diagnostic or prognostic prediction. So specifically, we were asking the question beyond segmentation, beyond detection, could we provide a deep learning algorithm, a set of slides where we knew what the outcome was? Could we then train the deep learning algorithm to directly tell us what the outcome for these patients might be? And so one of the first problems we looked at was looking at endomyocardial biopsies, where these patients had had biopsies of the heart. We knew which ones had heart failure and which ones were normal. And so we trained a deep learning algorithm with a set of uh, studies coming from 100 patients. And the goal was really based on the endomyocardial biopsies to distinguish heart failure from naught. And then we had another set of 105 patients that were used as the independent validation set. So to make this interesting, we trained the deep learning algorithm, but then also went head to head with two pathologists on the validation set of 105 patients. And I apologize that the, the font size is as small as it is, but the area under the curve for the deep learning algorithm on the validation set came out to 0.97. For the two pathologists, cardiac pathologists who looked at the validation set cases, the problem of distinguishing heart failure from not, their average area under the curve was 0.74. So a 23 point differential for the deep learning algorithm over the pathologist in distinguishing heart failure from not based on the endomyocardial biopsy. Now I'll be the first to admit this was a very contrived problem, but we wanted to really see whether deep learning could go beyond just detection segmentation to really try to address you know, higher level prognostic problems. So this was exciting, we published this uh, last year. I reached out to my media relations office at the uh, university at Case Western. I said, you know, we've got this approach, we've got this algorithm, we have this paper, and you know, we should put a paper out to talk about how you know, deep learning can really serve as an important tool to aid the pathologist in uh, better diagnostic assessment. You know, like uh, Peter mentioned at the end of his talk, you know, how can you know, AI help as a decision support tool for the pathologist. And so at least that was the way I envisioned the story in my head, you know, AI, deep learning, helping the pathologist. Fortunately, uh, that's not quite how the story ultimately took off. Uh, G reports picked the story up and, you know, went for the sexier tagline of computer beats doctor again. Um, and then found out um, that I was trending on Reddit briefly. One of my students wrote to me, saying, hey, you're on Reddit. And I had to write back saying, what the heck is Reddit? I'm a, I'm a Twitter uh, person myself. Um, and so apparently the story made it out to Reddit and you know, started to get a lot of comments. And so there's a lot of excitement around deep learning beating the doctors. Um, so to those who are not familiar with Reddit, so you know these stories based on the amount of discussion around these stories sort of keep rising up the ranks. And so we broke into the top 10 or top 15. And you can see here a number of different comments about the story. So I actually perused a whole bunch of them and picked out one that I thought was particularly interesting that I thought I'd share with you. So I'll leave it up there for a second. So, you know, if this whole AI computational pathology thing doesn't work out, you know, I might have a backup career here. But the postscript of the story is as follows. After we'd done the initial validation study, we reached out to the University of Pennsylvania and said, you know, send us another batch of cases. And so they did, another set of 90 patients. And when we ran the same algorithm on the new set of 90 patients, remember this is the same lab, the same city, the same hospital, uh, the same demographic, right, the same catchment area. For this new set of 90 patients, where the question again was distinguishing heart failure from not, the accuracy of the algorithm went from 97% down to 75%, right, a huge, precipitous drop in the performance. Nothing had fundamentally changed, right? The scanner was the same. Uh, the slides were being coming from the same lab. And, you know, we spent months trying to figure out exactly what had happened. And the closest that we came to was the fact that the software scan, the scanner, the digital slide scanner, had a remote software upgrade applied to it. And that software upgrade possibly had perturbed the distribution and the attributes of the images ever so slightly 
that the network now was not as confident as it was previously. And so that sort of segues, I guess, into the next part of the talk, which is, you know, we need to really be careful about some of these algorithms. We need to take a more measured approach to these algorithms. Uh, this is a quote from um, Professor Michael Jordan, a, a, a professor of machine learning at UC Berkeley, you know, who, who really says that trusting these brute force algorithms too much is a, is a faith misplaced. And we're seeing more and more examples of the lack of generalizability of these algorithms going from one side to another. And so we really need to be very, very careful in how we think about you know, some of these more opaque, um, you know, black box kind of approaches where you don't really have a sense of exactly what is going on inside. And so we need to be careful about trusting them too much on one single validation set. We really have to see how these things perform across multiple different uh, sites. And this was another interesting story that I want to share with the group. Um, you know, when this entire thing happened with, with our network and the performance going down, I sort of went online to see whether there were other examples of um, what we were observing. And I came across a story out of UC Irvine. Samir Singh, a, a professor of computer science, um, shared this anecdote where he and his student trained a neural network deep learning algorithm to distinguish huskies from wolves, from images from uh, the internet. And they trained the network and then applied it to a test set and found that they had a 99% accuracy in distinguishing huskies from wolves. And so Samir, who clearly is way smarter than I am, quickly realized that that didn't make sense because huskies and wolves look very, very similar to each other. So if a network was coming in 99% accuracy, something had to be wrong somewhere. And so what they finally were able to figure out was that the network wasn't actually learning features of the face of the animal. What it was learning were attributes to the background because huskies were always against a white background. There was always snow in the background. And that's what the network was picking up, right? And so again, it's a sort of a cautionary tale here that we need to make a better effort to really try to understand you know, with AI and deep learning and neural networks, really what is driving these architectures? What is the network really learning? Because if we don't, then the challenge is when the network doesn't work, we're not going to be able to figure out how to fix these issues how to fix the problems. And so what I want to talk about in the time I have left is some of the approaches that we've been developing in our group around handcrafted features or domain-inspired features, where the goal is really to use, it's, this is not to say that we shut out deep learning. Deep learning, I think, is a very, very powerful approach. Um, but to use it in a way that allows us to go in and identify attributes from pathology images from which we can now start to extract features that are more intuitive more interpretable. As one, um, uh, so one particular use case here is work that our group is doing in looking at the role of collagen fibers and the orientation of collagen fibers as a potential prognostic feature in breast cancer. So in work that uh, we recently showcased at ASCO, we used deep learning to first look at H&E images, looked at identifying collagen fibers from H&E images, and then made the observation that if you looked at the orientation of the polarity of the collagen fibers in H&E images, they were quite different between patients who had long-term survival versus short-term survival. So interestingly, patients with long-term survival had more disordered collagen fiber orientation with respect to the uh, periphery of the tumor versus short-term survivors uh, where there was less uh, disorder in the orientation fibers. And in over 400 patients, we found that this uh, orientation of the collagen fiber was strongly prognostic of survival. Uh, and this was based on patients both from the TCGA as well as ECOG-2197, a clinical trial uh, for early stage ER positive breast cancers. So that's sort of one example of intuitive, interpretable features um, which uses deep learning, but deep learning being used primarily to identify and segment out features of interest. Here's another use case from a paper that we published last year where deep learning was used to identify the individual nuclei, but then looking at the shape of the nuclei as well as the polarity of the individual nuclei, we are again able to separate out between patients who had short-term survival versus long-term survival. Here we found that patients who had long-term survival, the orientations of the nuclei were actually more structured, more organized compared to patients who had short-term survival where the orientations of the cells were more chaotic, more uh, disorganized. Uh, and so this is sort of my tongue-in-cheek, head-to-head comparison between the Oncotype DX test uh, from Genomic Health and the image-based risk score. This is very much 
tongue in cheek, so please indulge me here. Uh, one is the cost. This is a $4,600 test. The image-based risk score, on the other hand, you could really, you know, present this for pennies on the dollar because the cost of the test, you know, all you need is a digital slide image and the cost of electricity to run your algorithms on that digital slide image. A big advantage is the fact that you can shoot the images up to the cloud, run the analysis, and get the results back to the ordering clinician anywhere in the world, uh, really within minutes, because you don't have to physically ship tissue blocks um, out to a specialized lab, and so therefore you have a global footprint. Um, so in other words, you have an inexpensive, fast, reliable, accessible prognostic breast cancer test that's priceless for everything else there's MasterCard. What's also interesting is that we've looked at how a simple image-based risk score can be combined with the $4,600 test and showed um, at last year's ASCO meeting that the combination of this image score improved the performance of Oncotype BX by 20%. So let's just put this in context. We could take this $4,600 test, essentially combine that with the results of a $4.60 test and show that we can now identify 20% more women who were truly low risk, who could therefore avoid adjuvant chemotherapy compared to what was assessed or identified solely based off this very expensive molecular test. So there's a real advantage here. And it's not just the price saving, it's actually being able to improve the specificity and the sensitivity of these molecular diagnostic tests. But the beauty is that this test, this, 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 the ability to leverage features and patterns from tumor morphology really extends out to multiple other use cases as well. This is work we're doing in lung cancer where we found that looking just at the differences in appearance, shape, and size of individual cancer cells from tissue slide images in early stage squamous cell carcinomas is, was strongly prognostic of survival. This is with a, a, a validation set of 237 patients. Similarly, we've shown that the same idea is true also in early stage lung adenocarcinomas. Um, Jonathan talked about prostate cancer. This is an area that uh, we've been working on as well, looking just at 2D images of prostate cancer. In a large study that we just presented at the ASCO meeting in over 900 patients across six different sites, we showed that patterns relating to gland shape and gland arrangement alone were strongly prognostic of biochemical recurrence in these patients after surgery. And it wasn't just in all comers. We also found that specifically in the margin negative patients, so in other words, the patients who were identified as low risk based off the radical prostatectomy specimens, the uh, features from the, the IBRIS features from the pathology images actually were able to identify a subset of patients who were higher risk, even though they were identified at surgery as all marginal negative. Um, this has been applied to oral cavity squamous cell carcinomas as well. And again, we found that we could prognosticate survival and progression uh, better than a lot of the clinical parameters, T stage, N stage. Uh, what was interesting, and this was presented at the USCAP meeting earlier this year, was that, at least in the US, the oral cancer staging is done based on the AJCC criteria, the 8th edition AJCC criteria. And the AJCC staging obviously determines how these patients get treated. So if you're low risk or low, um, uh, so determine is low risk based on AJCC, you typically will get surgery alone. You won't get any adjuvant treatment. If you're intermediate risk, you get adjuvant radiation, um, and you might get adjuvant chemo and radiation if you're determined to be high risk. We did a subset analysis with the low risk group alone. These are patients who only get surgery, don't get the adjuvant treatment, and found that we were able to identify, based of H&E images alone, a distinctive subset of patients who were at higher risk, and so therefore could really benefit from adjuvant radiation, even though, based on the AJCC 8th edition criteria, they were all identified as low risk. I talked about how deep learning is still important uh, to identify primitives of interest from which one can then extract intuitive interpretable features. And this is a, a case in point where working with Dr. Jim Lewis at Vanderbilt University, we use deep learning to go and identify multinucleation. So these are so specific primitives and whole slide images where you've got multiple different nuclei overlapping with each other. And so just identifying the number of these events turns out to be strongly prognostic of outcome in head and neck cancers, in P16 positive or HPV associated oropharyngeal tumors. And this is a study that we're just about to submit to publication with nearly uh, 700 patients um, analyzed. So just the cancer nuclei. Um, 
there's also, as you've heard from talks this morning, a lot of information latent in immune cells. And so the beauty is that from h &E slide images, even though you may not be able to really subtype the different categories of immune cells, you can actually identify tills, right? You can identify the stromal tills, you can identify the intratumoral uh, infiltrating lymphocytes. And so that's what we did. We used deep learning to identify tills as well as the cancer nuclei. The tills are in green here, the cancer nuclei in red. Essentially made the observation that if you look at the spatial interplay between tills and cancer cells, the arrangements are quite different in patients who tend to do well, that is not have recurrence, versus patients who actually tend to do poorly, that is actually do have recurrence. So in a paper that we published a few months ago in clinical cancer research, we found that this unique spatial configuration of cancer cells and immune cells was strongly prognostic of recurrence in early stage lung cancer. But more interestingly, what we've also found is that by looking at H&E slides alone, this spatial co-arrangement of tills and cancer cells is also predictive of response to checkpoint inhibitor therapy. So in patients with non-small cell lung cancer get treated with uh, checkpoint inhibitors, um, we looked at about uh, a set of initially 82 patients, 32 were used for training, 50 for independent validation. Uh, we found that the spatial co-arrangement feature um, was quite different between patients who were responders versus non-responders. And for good measure, we also just compared this against the total till count um, from these patients. And the till count actually was not predictive of response, but the spatial co-arrangement of tills with respect to the immune cells, or the cancer cells with respect to immune cells, was actually predictive of response. In more recent data, we found that the spatial co-arrangement of immune cells and cancer cells is not just predictive of response, but strongly associated with overall survival and this is, this is a study that we're getting ready to submit for publication, just been completed on 121 patients with actually three different checkpoint inhibitors, dorvalumab, nivolumab, as well as pembrolizumab from three different sites. I talked about the cardiac uh, story with the NMI cardial biopsies. Uh, so we came back, revisited the problem, and actually looked at the spatial arrangement of the tills, of the, uh, well, not the tills, but the immune cells in the cardiac biopsies, and found that we could actually get a very similar AUC, but now this was an AUC that was more robust. So we got a 0.98 AUC in actually distinguishing different rejection grades of uh, cardiac biopsies. Uh, but now, because we're basing this off the spatial arrangement of the immune cells, this is a far more robust and resilient signature. Uh, we've shown that uh, the spatial arrangement of TILs and cancer nuclei is also prognostic of survival in triple negative breast cancers. Uh, more recently shown that this is also strongly prognostic of overall survival in ovarian cancers. Uh, one of the other things that we've been trying to figure out is, you know, where should one interrogate these images? These, these are large images. And while there's a lot of value in looking at the tumor, clearly there's a lot of value looking outside the tumor as well. And so in a paper we published a couple of years ago, we found that patterns of nuclear morphology outside the tumor, specifically in tumor-adjacent benign regions, was more strongly prognostic of biochemical recurrence compared to corresponding patterns that we mined just from the tumor foci alone. More recently, in, uh, in work that was presented at ASCO and currently under review uh, for publication, we found that patterns of the stroma, or stromal morphology, was not just predictive of biochemical recurrence, but also strongly different between African-American men with prostate cancer versus Caucasian men with prostate cancer. And why that's important is because that suggests that there are strong phenotypic differences in the prostate cancer presentation between these two populations. And so what we did was to create a population-specific model for African-Americans and showed that when you account for the specific attributes found within populations, you get prognostic models that are far more accurate, far more specific for that population versus a model where you ignore those differences or a population agnostic model. Uh, and so this was sort of an interesting finding as well. Um, one of the big issues um, is, of course, resilience and robustness across sites. And I talked about the issue we had with deep learning. And so that is the very real issue that a lot of these features that we're mining from whole slide images can also vary across sites, can across, vary across labs. And so we've been paying a lot of attention to how to pick the features. There's a temptation to always pick the most accurate features, the most discriminating features. But we've started to incorporate in our feature selection strategy 
the robustness and the resilience of the features. So as we look to try to identify what features to go into your machine learning model to account not, for, not just for discriminability, but also stability across sites. And so it's really a combination of discriminability and stability of the features that really that um, you need to ensure uh, that you have the best possible generalizability across multiple different sites and labs. Um, and then just one thing that I want to talk about right here at the end is HistoQC, which is an automated quality control program that's been developed by our group. Uh, this is free to use. You can download it from here. Essentially, it's a, a digital tool that allows you to analyze your whole slide images and comes up with a quality assessment score for the fidelity of those slide images. Um, we published this recently and shown in over a thousand slides that the tool can also identify the presence of artifacts uh, such as uh, cracks in the glass or pen marks. Uh, and so this could be used as a way to identify which slides are really diagnostically worthy, but also computationally worthy in order to train your uh, algorithms. Um, just want to sort of a uh, shout out to Jonathan's work here. It's a, been a great collaboration over the last um, a few months working with Jonathan Liu's group. Uh, and this is something I'm very, very excited about, applying some of these approaches to analyzing 3D pathology. Um, it sort of really opens up this entire treasure trove of new features, new attributes to look at building on the work that we've done with uh, 2D pathology and 2D pathomics. And so with that, I'd like to conclude. So hopefully what I've conveyed is that computational analytics with routine imaging can help address questions in precision medicine, specifically prognosis and predicting response to therapy. I think one thing that is really critical about all of this is the fact that we're talking about things that are non-destructive, low cost, and therefore could really have global impact, which is going to be critically important in low and middle income countries. I also want to sort of throw out there my two cents about the adoption, the clinical adoption of these tools. And my own bias is that interpretability and having an intuitive basis to your features, to your models is going to be a critical driver for clinical adoption, particularly when you're talking about predicting response to therapy or identifying who should get what therapy. Of course, it takes a village to do the work. I only like to come in and take credit for, uh, for all this stuff that I showed. These are the people who are really the rock stars, the folks back in Cleveland who do all the heavy lifting, my amazing crew of um, uh, faculty colleagues, my uh, students and postdocs. Uh, very, very privileged to be working with this amazing group. And of course, you always have to thank uh, the funding agencies, the folks who put food on the table. So thank you very much. <laughs>